Hey guys, Rachel here. Thank you again for being part of my journey, part of my videos. I really appreciate everybody who's taken the time to watch the things that I'm doing. Make sure if you're loving what I'm doing, you subscribe, you like, you comment, all of those things so I can keep doing what I love and sharing it with everybody. I'm doing my best in trying to build these videos so people can understand what I'm doing, learn a few tips and tricks, and just have an insight in what the daily looks like in my shop. I do my best at trying to share all of these things. It does get tricky because when I get building, I do get into it. But I'll try to make sure that I stop and I explain what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, and what I'm doing it for. So just stay with me. Uh, thanks again for following along, you guys. Again, subscribe, like, comment, all that stuff. Now let's get building. Okay, so in the other build, I had put together these pieces. So these two pieces here are going to be the end of this studio bench. So these will be on either side. And then this piece that I'm having in the middle is going to be for the top. I'm having some nice live edge wood pieces that I'm putting in for the top. It's going to be quite big, quite heavy. So this is a design I build as you go kind of thing. Um, I have a drawing of what I want it to look like. Uh, I'll share with you guys. I've worked with a customer and they've given me a few Pinterest ideas, a few things that they've loved, and so I can take all those ideas and kind of put it all together. They've given me a bit of creative design freedom uh, in order to kind of play with things to make sure that everything looks good and has the vision that they're looking for for their salon. So I'll show you guys the photo that I drew. Now don't laugh because I am certainly not an artist on paper. I cannot draw a stick man for the life of me. So when I do my blueprints, they tend to look like this. And as you see, you know, that might look like a butt. And you know, that looks like a bunch of scribbles, but it all makes sense in my head. And what it is actually in my head is not what this is going to be. But essentially this is all my measurements that I have. I sit and I do kind of a, a rough draft, what I need to cut my material at, um, how tall everything needs to be. And I'll just lay that out for myself. And then this becomes something a lot nicer. So this is what I'm working with right now. So in the middle here, we're going to have the, the live edge wood piece. Um, the top here, I'm going to build a planter so they can have some plants up top. And then I'm going to bring out my ring roller and I'm going to make some metal rings and I'm going to have some circular mirrors. So this is for the center of the studio uh, for the studio chairs for where people get their hair cut. So, you know, we've, I've worked with the, I've worked with the gal there. Uh, she's explained all the things that she wants to have for it. So I can make sure that I have all the heights of everything, the sizes of the mirrors, um, and all come together so it all looks beautiful. So let's get going. For right now, I have to cut a couple angled pieces for this, as this piece is where the wood is going to sit on top of. You're not going to see it, but I do want to make it strong enough that it's going to hold this whole 120 inch long piece of wood. So it'll be 120 inches long, 30 inches wide. Those are the sides. This will hold the wood. And then I'm just going to keep building it until it becomes what's stuck inside this head of mine. Let's go. So the width of this is 24 inches. So I just have to cut two 45 inch piece or 24 inch pieces, both with 45s on them in order to get my end pieces. And then I'll have a few supports in the middle. I just have to decide where I want everything to be. But that's the fun of doing what I do is I get to make it up as I go. I'm just going to tidy up this table. Um, whenever I do any welding on this table, you know, you get welding spatter. When I'm feeling really in the mood, I will spray it down with anti-spatter spray. That gets a little bit messy. Uh, so I just take a sanding disc wherever that one is. I'll take a sanding disc and I'll just flatten all the spatter out so when I clamp all my material, nothing's going to be up or down. Because sometimes when you clamp things down and you have just, you know, a little piece of spatter there, that's going to shift your pieces even if it's just a sixteenth of an inch. It does make a difference. So, I'm going to make sure I have this table cleaned up and then get everything clamped where I need it to be. Are you 
Important things like earplugs. La di da. Don't wreck those ear holes of yours, people. And if you do not have a leaf blower yet for your shop, you need to have one. Uh, you know, as welding happens, woodwork happens, any of that stuff happens, it builds up with dust in here. So once a week, every once a week, I open up the doors, put on a dust mask, and I just blow everything out of my shop to get all the dust and gross stuff out of here. I like to have a clean shop. I feel way more organized when everything is all together and where it needs to be. So I just give it a quick burst of air and just to clean everything off my table. <laughs> I have my little baby heater here to keep me warm. It is Canada. It is still cold. It's very unfortunate. And as you can see, my table is not big enough to reach to the very end of this, so all that I'm going to do is I'm going to put, tack this top piece into place, and then I'm going to push it all this way, and then I'll tack that piece into place, and then I will show you how I make it square. But first, I'm going to cut the two pieces that I need for my ends. So a few years back, I elevated saws. I had just an abrasive chop saw, which was fine uh, for what it was that I was doing. And then I discovered the cold cut saw. And this one is the Fane uh, Slugger. Is that Fane? Made by Fane? This is a Slugger. Anyways, I think it's Fane that makes this. Um, but it was a game changer for me. As in, like, This is a game changer for me going from the abrasive saw to the cold cut saw. Um, there's a couple things that I don't love about this saw. For one, when you are um, changing your angles, it has this little handle here that you pull back, but this is, you pull it up to shift it, and then you lock it into place by putting it down. And I've had this for a few years now, and this is just so worn out from trying to lock it and from changing the angles all the time. Um, I mean, it, it does the job. I can't complain. It was pretty expensive. Uh, but I'm in the process right now of trying to work with um, Evolution and getting their miter saw. If anybody's seen that one out there, I'm so excited to get that and to start working with that one. Um, it's just, it's incredible how once you start to spend a little money and spend a, a little, do a little more research on the tools that you use all the time, how much of a difference it makes in cleanliness, in you know, cleaning up your material that you're using, all that kind of stuff. So I'm excited to try this Evolution saw when I get it. But this is what I got for now. So I have this just set on 45 degrees. The other thing is like you have your lines on here that tell you the degrees. So when you're setting it at 45 degrees, it doesn't always match. So I take my little trusty square here, and then I always just give it a quick check. I mean, even right now, like just from me moving that, that's shifted a bit. But you have to kind of, ugh, you gotta fiddle quite a bit. If, if you want to have, you know, perfect, perfect 45. I like to, I like a good fit up when I'm doing my welds. Yeah, you can get away with a degree here and there, but this seems to be, it also gets filled up with uh, bits in here. So I usually vacuum this once a week as well, just to get all the bits, sometimes more than once a week, um, just to get all the bits out of here. But when I got this saw, I built this stand for it so that I could have it on wheels so that I could move it side to side. I started my shop in a very small space, so I needed to be able to move everything around. So this made a big difference. 
Yeah, I mean, it's off a little bit, but I can fiddle with things to make it exactly what I want. So now I'm just going to cut these to 24 inches. Find tape measure. Another thing you think is a really great idea is these magnetic tape measures. But when you're using a magnetic tape measure on a chop saw, you get all that buildup. And if you don't realize that all that, all that stuff is stuck to your um, tape measure when you're measuring things, that'll make up to like, gosh, I had a pile of stuff on here. It was like quarter of an inch that it could make a difference. So I don't usually use these ones for at my chop saw, but this is what I grabbed. So this is what I'm using. Um, yeah. I always like to draw my lines on here. Then you can kind of know where it is that you need to be following on your line. Uh, again, I like precision measurements when I'm doing things. I like to things to really, really fit nice um, when I'm doing all my prep for all my materials. So. A little extra time makes a big difference. It makes for less time when you're welding. So the other thing I always, always like to do is make sure I'm utilizing getting the most out of a piece of material. So I had these 24 foot lengths of two inch square tubing that I'm using. And you know, just doing a bit of simple math is just making sure that you're cutting each length to leave you with the least waste. So from that piece, I had just this piece left over. So that gave me the least waste for all the pieces that I'll have to cut. So that's just a nice way to get the most out of the material that you have. Um, but for the, this cold cut saw, uh, it does leave just a little bit of a, like a burr on the edge of that. So, and then plus you have your mill scale on here. So I usually just take a sanding disc, flapper disc, whatever, just get the mill scale off uh, and then grind off these little extra bits. Uh, that makes for a much better weld when you are putting everything together. And even these little burrs, when you have them sitting down on the table, uh, sometimes they can have it sit up or down. So having everything ground up, all your material prep makes a huge difference when you're putting things together. Okay, I have all my pieces cut. So when you look at my square, you might be like, why the heck is this half inch um, tubing welded to it? But when you're doing your corners inside, trying to get your square, when you have, if you look at the profile of this square tubing, it's got a lip on it. So when you put your square down right onto the table of it, it kind of gets stuck inside there, and so you can't actually see exactly if you're square or not. And so this just makes it a little bit easier, again, too, so you can just pick it up from, instead of having it right down flat on the table. I just find it so much more handy for when I'm doing this. Um, I, would, I went to put it on both sides so that I can flip it for my short end from one side to the other. But when I do this other side, I'll show you guys. I'll bring you in closer and show you exactly why I do it. Turn on this bad boy. And maybe my welder will spitter spatter a little bit. I need to change my liner really, really badly. Uh, I have one. I just need to make the time to do it. Uh, my tips are getting a little old. My nozzles are getting a little old. Um, 
So sometimes this just gets, the wire gets stuck inside. Um, I need to just, every now and again, I think probably once a month or, well, at this rate, once every three months, I will open up my machine and I'll take everything apart. If I don't want to change my liner, at the very least, I'll take some compressed air and blow it, uh, blow it out, like put my, um, put the cable all the way straight, blow all the stuff that's out inside, go one way, go the other way, take out all my drive rolls, give them a good cleanup, uh, just make sure that this thing runs in good shape because we take care of our machines, they take care of us. Good enough is what I'm gonna go for right now. So when I'm putting these pieces in here, so you can see when I put this down here, it kind of gets lost underneath the, underneath the curve of this square tubing. So it makes it a little bit trickier um, when you're trying to get a proper square. And so when I put this on this side, it sits above everything. It sits above all those curves, makes it easier to pick it up, uh, stick your hands underneath and pick it up. I just find this a little bit handier for what it is that I do. And then I just wanna clamp everything into place so I can get all my measurements. And so by cleaning up the table and all the stuff off the table, um, I was able to um, make sure that everything's going to sit nice and flat where I need this to be. I'm just going to double truly believe you could never have too many clamps. So if I'm getting to be a stickler on it, it's exactly 24 and 1 16th is what I have that one. I want this one to match. So clamping this uh, clamp with the pad on it kind of halfway in between so then you can, it flushes the two pieces up just perfectly. So that is exactly 24 and 1 16th. And because I'm not putting the other end on right now, I'm gonna actually just clamp the back pieces and just make sure my measurements are still the same. Uh, so this one I know is square. So when I'm tacking these, I always tack just the outside corners. Um, sometimes if you're holding up the square and you know that, that that end will need to go out, you tack the top corner. And if you know that it needs to go in, then you tack this corner because then you still have room for it to open up on either end where you need that space. So when I held the square in here, I know that, that it needs to go out on that back end so I can tack these corners and then I can go move it from the other side. Come on. Told ya. Told ya it was going to happen. And I get my professional safety squint going. And my gas didn't quite make it through there. Or my gas wasn't on at all. I love when that happens. Um, so yeah, I know that end will need to go out, but I know that this one is just perfect. So I've uh, clamped it here, clamped it back here, so I know that these are just not gonna go anywhere. So I'm gonna clamp this top corner, and I'm gonna clamp this inside corner. Maybe, again. I need a new liner. And I need new tips. And I need to spend a little money on just kind of 
cleaning all these things up. Maybe that will be a next video. <laughs> How to clean up your welder. It is important. It's just we don't always have the time to do it. Okay. I'll pull this outside piece and just give it a clamp. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, because everything is clamped exactly where I want it to be, I'm going to just do some tacks on all four, or, well, four corners that I can get to. Then I'm going to weld the thing solid, keep everything clamped down for now until it just kind of has a quick cool off time. Um, and then I can move everything forward and then make sure I get the other end all squared up. So I know in school they teach you don't downhand weld. Uh, for this kind of stuff, for these corner edges and my inside edges, I always downhand weld. It makes a nice weld. I have it hot enough. Um, you know, this isn't an overly structural piece for a lot of these things, uh, especially when you're using lighter gauge stuff. You're going to fuse the metals anyways. So I like the downhand. It makes a nice clean weld, easy to clean up, easy to round off. Uh, you're getting the main structure, uh, the, me the mega strength from your weld on these top welds anyways because it's going to have lots of heat put into them. I do grind them flat, but they're still this kind of stuff you guys, you don't need to overthink uh, the angles of your welds and all that kind of stuff. Pushing, pulling, you know, whatever fuses this metal together that works best for you. Um, I'm a pusher. That's just what I do for a lot of the stuff. If I'm getting into structural stuff, then yes, I'll pay more attention to um, the proper processes for each one of these things. But if you want a downhand weld, downhand weld. The other nice thing about clamps is when you are doing any welding, I always like to move things so I have somewhere to rest my hand instead of trying to hold onto the welder by itself. So just having somewhere to rest it up. Some days the Mastercraft are not the way that I want to go. Um, that's right now. Especially when your batteries are getting low on your tools, uh, these Mastercraft ones just aren't great. And plus, I have a 120 grit on there, which I shouldn't. I should have like a, an 80 grit or something. But these sanding discs are my favorite for taking things down. Best bang for your buck because they're dirt cheap. Um, and I get 35 grit sanding discs and the backing pads. This is not the right size backing pad. This is a four and a half inch backing pad. I need a five inch one. But that works. It's going to work for me for now. I don't have to get too crazy about cleaning this up. Um, this isn't going to be a finished end, so I mean, nobody's going to see this because the wood is going to sit on top of it. Still like it to look nice. I like it to be flat. Um, I like all the welds to look good, um, but this is just what the wood piece is going to be rested on. So I'm just going to clean this up as best as I can. Oh, I must. Still on. I'm still kicking myself for the whole video that I did. Uh, and I didn't turn my microphone on, so I had to voice over all of it. It was really annoying. I tend to like to use the corded grinders when I'm doing, like taking off the bulk of welds on these things. Uh, these things lose power quite quickly. I have three of these Milwaukee grinders, and they're all different. I've got them all at different phases of life. Um, this is my first one that I got for Mother's Day. I love it, but it's it was kind of one of their more earlier models, um, and it's it's great. This probably has the most power. Well, this one, then this one I got at another time, but this has the rapid stop. So it stops automatically when you're grinding, which is kind of nice for some things. Um, but this one I got in a kit. It was like a five piece kit. I got a um, circular saw. I got the uh, Sawzall 
uh, impact and drill. And I got this in it. Oh, I got the flashlight, which I drove over with my truck. Still works. Uh, but this one does not work very well. It's, I don't like the paddle. I don't love the paddle anyways. Well, I just find that this one just runs out of power so, so quickly. Uh, but then this one, it doesn't, my switch has stopped working. So I have to push it down and in to get it to work. So that one's got its tricks. So this one is the best one so far, but you can see that's the way that it stops differently. That stops fast. And that one doesn't have it all to stop. So that one will just keep rolling, rolling, rolling until it stops. So I do like the wrap stop. It is handy for when you're working quickly. Um, but yeah, when you buy these ones in the kits, they just, this one's not a fuel. This one's, these ones are, yeah, these ones are both a fuel one and this one's not. And they make a big difference. So if you're getting a cordless grinder, which I highly recommend, I do recommend that you get the fuel because they have far more power. And I also recommend you get the wrap stop. They work much better. I'm going to change my disc on this one. And then you guys can see for the ones, for those who don't use sanding discs, is you take off all the pieces um, on there and then you just have this little backing pad that sits on there. And then your sanding disc goes on top and then you tighten it with that little fella. And once I discovered these, it was a game changer. I saved many, many pennies on uh, having to buy flapper discs because you can go through flapper discs so quickly. Ha! Got it in. <laughs> That last one I had on there, I had for, I've had on for two jobs that I've done so far. So they last a while for, I only use them for getting the bulk of the material off. Then I'll switch to a flapper. And then when I'm really finishing, I'll switch to my orbital uh, with a hook and loop sanding disc on it. So I don't know if you guys could see how, how flat that makes that. The nice thing about these sanding discs is you can just push flat as long as you're pushing center and you're not uh, pushing more on one side than the other, then you get just a perfect flat uh, cleanup from your weld. I really like these for even doing, uh, when you're doing automotive stuff, when you're doing body work, uh, they, you can really focus on where you're taking the metal because especially in thinner gauge stuff, you do not want to take any of the material of your base metal. You only want to take the bulk of a weld off. So these you can get pretty finicky and dial it in for making sure you're only taking off the parts that you need. But have to be very good at knowing that because otherwise these will take chunks of metal off at a time uh, if you're using a higher um, higher grit. Okay, so we have this now welded solid. We are happy. I am happy. Bingo. That's exactly what I want. Okay, so now I'm going to undo my clamps. I'm going to move everything uh, this way. No, I lied. I'm not going to move everything this way. I'm just going to flip this whole thing around and then do the same thing on this side. I'm just going to give these a quick cleanup from the little bit of spatter that was there. this to my table too I like to have this edge hanging over just a little bit so that when I do my welds I can get all three welds without worrying about welding into the table because that happens so I'm gonna start with just clamping one side and I can fiddle fuddle with this where I need it to be So I know what I want my width to be, so if I find that, it's amazing how much this springs in and out when you, um, 
when you weld it, when you weld it all together, they're going to want to pull in. Because whenever you heat something up, you know, the structure of metal can change quite quickly. As one of my old foremans called it, Mr. Shrinky. That's one thing that's never left my brain, Mr. Shrinky. And I still get a kick out of it to this day. That's where I want all them. So this is just going to kind of sit where it sits. I might need to cut this a little bit shorter. Okay, so this is about three sixteenths longer than I want it to be. The one thing I didn't do when I was putting those together, I just kind of butted this up to where it looked good, but I really should have measured to make sure that they were the exact same in length. Uh, but this is off. I mean, it's not much. Again, it's an eighth of an inch um, that these are off in, in uh, length, and that's not the end of the world, but I want this to be perfect. I want this whole thing to be 120 inches in total. So this needs to be 116, uh, and then each of those will be two inches. So. I'm going to just cut uh, about an eighth of an inch off of this piece, and then it'll sink in a little bit more, and I can fiddle with it to get the exact measurement I'm looking for. Okay, this will be better. Oop. I try to use the same tape measure uh, the entire time when I'm building things because it is pretty amazing how tape measures can be even just a little bit different. So I try my best when I'm doing the framing. When I'm cutting things, it's one thing. Ah! Also, invest in a good tape measure. It makes a big difference. Okay, so that's 116. I mean, it's 16th over. Barely. So I'm just going to take that for what it is. And give it a tack. Safety squid. Real thing. Look it up. Noise. <laughs> this isn't my best tape measure. It's better than my other ones that I bought at Princess Auto. Okay, I want to get that clamped. Local gadget tape measure. Lovely. Okay. So that's exactly where I want that to be. Um, I've learned my lesson over the years. I get pretty brandy and I can be pretty aggressive when it comes to mindlessly doing things. I've worked in construction for so many years um, that it didn't really make that much of a difference. And you're doing things fast. You want to get them done. You want to get them out of there. So when I started building things, you know, like these custom things for people, I still use massive metal hammers 
like sledgehammers were if I wanted to move something, even if it was just a bit here and there, I'd be honking on it with a metal hammer. So really over, you know, the last 10 years, have you rec have I recognized that that still will leave a dent. And when you get your things powder coated uh, and they'll have these big dents in them, you just really want to pay attention to that. So investing in a dead blow hammer or in a rubber hammer makes a big difference. No! Happy, happy. Perfect. Okay, so I'm giving these both tacks in the outside corners. Lovely. And sometimes when I'm doing uh, these mat, like these uh, tack ups, I like to just rub my hand along the seams. And I mean, it's same again when you're doing body work on a car, uh, running your hand along because you can feel. I mean, I hate wearing gloves. I've always hated wearing gloves, uh, but that's because when I started welding, they only had men gloves. <laughs> they only had man sized gloves. So I just got so used to never ever wearing gloves, and that was fine. Um, but now, you know, my daughter asks me if, or <laughs> my daughter looked at a photo and so thought, oh, I thought those were grandma's hands. So, I mean, I know I pay the repercussions of, of that, but I didn't know any different. I didn't have the proper uh, workwear like they do now for women. So, you know, I pay the price for that now. But I try to wear just these thin Milwaukee ones. I have higher level, these are just like the cut level one. So you could buy higher cut level ones. They're not great for welding because they will melt and all the sparks will make them. Uh, get tons of holes in them, but I mean, it's saving my hands a little bit. Meanwhile, still giving me the dexterity and the feel that I need in order to make sure that everything is um, sitting where it should be. I mean, I feel like this is a little bit high, so when I do go to tack my corner to corner, or go, go to tack the rest of it, I'll clamp this again. But we're going to measure this up. This is a, another really great way to ensure that you're getting everything perfectly square. So in order to get your proper measurement, so making sure, because you can have a frame and it can be all measured the right way, all measured the right measurements, but it could be tilted. And you don't know that until you measure from the corner, corner to corner to corner. So once you have that measurement, if I'm to go here, I'm just gonna do that for now. So this is exactly 118 and 7 16 and then on the opposite side of it, I'm actually just going to, I'm going to clamp that in the middle. I'll double check that other one. I need to get one of those tape measures that doesn't kink. So that is 118 and 7 sixteenths. So bingo, bango. I mean, when you're using a square and you're using your measurements, it should be perfectly square. So for my double checker, exactly 1 18th and 7 16th. So that is exactly where I want it to be. So if I throw, you know, a couple more clamps, I'm going to throw these clamps on here just to even those two out. Lovely. Same here. I'll just throw a clamp right in the middle here. I've had this table for years and years, and as I got to do some bigger jobs, I was just so sick of doing things on my floor. Um, this is just the next level in what it is that I wanted, but I just built these extensions onto my table, and this piece of um, 3 eighths is just sitting here, but I have it so I can bring it out further. It'll still have a space in the middle, but it works out really well because I can still clamp things with that space in the middle, and it just gives me a little bit of extra working space. Uh, I had to do a job. I needed an extra piece of material, so I ended up having to cut it out of this 3 8 plate. So my dream is to build myself a 5 by 10, probably 4 by 10 is all I need, table, but that has extensions, because I do you know, some really long railings, and when I'm doing a 20-foot railing, I'm just sick of doing it on my floor. You know, I, I still have 
the pads to sit on, to kneel on when I'm doing the work on the floor, but it's just not ideal for the body <laughs> as time goes on. So it is in my list of things to do to build myself a really, really nice fab table. Um, and that's, that'll happen one of these days. But for right now, this is what I have. So I'm a part of the party where I'm just going to kind of go with it. I have the centerpiece made. I have my sides made, so I want to put them together. I know the height that I want to have from the floor to the underside of this. I know that I want that to be 37 inches. Uh, so right now, I'm probably just going to throw this in hyperlapse so you don't have to watch me do this slowly. Um, just me trying to fiddle around. I'm going to try to jack, um, put some blocking underneath of here. Mark my marks onto where I want them there. Marky mark. Um, and then just try to play around and get everything clamped where I want it to be. So this is just going to be some fun in organizing this and getting this all ready for the next step. So here we go. You know, I don't always think about when I build things, as to how big they are, how heavy duty they are, uh, how I'm going to move them around my shop all by myself when I get to next steps. But this one shouldn't be so bad. Okay, so a quick update, uh, you know, I'm working with a client, sending pictures as I'm doing things, and when I have multiple designs that I'm trying to work with, so as I was doing this, I was just kind of looking at it and thinking about it, and I think I've shifted the way that I think it would look best, so I reached out to my client, and they agreed that the way that I have this now, it's, it's good, but I think what what we need for that space is a little bit of a slimmer, less industrial style piece. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm actually going to cut off, let's move that there. I'm actually going to cut these legs off and attach them just to the very bottom of this base. And I'm going to take these right off and I'm going to make them narrower because I'm going to have the plant holder that's going to be up top and I think that this is just too bulky for how I want to fit it together. I don't want it to be really boxy. So if I'm able to not use the two inch material for the top part, I'm going to use two inch by one inch rectangular tubing. And I'm going to just have it the width of the plant holder that I'm going to have in the top. So it'll make it look a little bit sleeker. It'll make it look a little bit, um, just flow a little bit nicer. Um, this is, this is why I, I do step by step with the customers and, you know, even sometimes what I think my vision will look good is not exactly, you know, how I want it to all come together. So it's okay. It's all part of the process, all part of the building. Don't ever get too bothered with kind of shifting things around and having to do things a little bit differently. Can always use the material for different things. You know, I have a ton of material kicking around all the time. So, um, I'm just going to get chopping this off, put the legs onto the very bottom, and then get building this top piece just a little bit differently than I had planned. So let's get to it.
<laughs> okay, so I'm doing much thinking right now uh, in how I just want this to be and just some different ways that I could do this. And the one thing that I was thinking is now that, now that I know that the top can be a little bit different, I have, I have changed my vision on how I want that to look and even with the wood going on top of it. So that I'm going to worry about. Next, what I'm thinking about right now is the legs. And so now that I'm not having a side coming up, I can actually have these legs put anywhere that I want them to be. So what I'm measuring out right now is the center. I have the center of this. Um, and above the above where this is going to go, there is going to there's two lights, um, two electrical wires that'll come down that will hook up to the lights, which then will hook up to the mirrors. So I want that center to center point of my mirrors to be 68 inches. So what I'm just trying to figure out is will these chairs still fit? If I have it, the legs coming down with enough space to fit one of their rolling caddies underneath there, and then they'll have one on this side. So I'm just playing around with some measurements right now, just trying to work things out in my head of how I want everything to sit. These legs right there. Then that eliminates my problem of having to have a center leg. So you guys have seen the process on how I build these frames. I'm going to be doing the exact same thing just with one inch square tubing for the top. So I'm going to power through that. I'll leave this here as part two of this studio bench build. And again, thank you so much for watching. Thanks so much for sharing the time of me spending on these fun projects that I get to do. I absolutely appreciate it. Don't forget all the things I always say, subscribe, like, comment, gotta say it, because that's just what I hope for. The more people that I have subscribed, the more money that I could make from doing this. And you know that gives me an opportunity to build my trucks, do some of these big dream projects that I have of my own. So thanks again. Appreciate you guys watching. Can't wait to share the rest of this build. <laughs>